Well, we've spent this Advent season talking about story, right? Telling the story and retelling the story and thinking about the stories that we love. What's, what's the story that, that, you know, that you had? Uh, what's a Christmas traditional story that you read or that you listened to or maybe watched on TV? Do you remember, some of you remember when you were really small, like when you were a little kid and you had the TV that actually like didn't hook up to cable? You know, there was like three channels, right? And the, there was that, for our, at our house, there was this galvanized pole that went up that was attached to the side of the house, which was handy because we used it to climb up on the roof, which was good because there were many things for us to do up there. And during the Christmas season, we would, you know, when the TV wasn't quite in tune, you'd climb, you know, you'd go outside and you'd twist the thing and somebody would be in by the TV like, yeah, yeah, yeah right there, right? <laughs> Pick up a little bit of signal and then you'd, and then you'd watch the, the things that you watched on TV. And one of, the, one of the stories that we always watched is um, by one of my favorite theologians, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Somebody, I, was, I was talking with this story, about this story to someone last night. They go, I didn't realize Dr. Seuss was a theologian. I said, everyone's a theologian. And it's true. Everyone is. Because when you're thinking about God, you're doing theology. And uh, this was a story that we, I don't think I ever... I don't think I've ever missed this story one time since I was just a little, little person. Uh, we watched this every year. Uh, we watched A Charlie Brown Christmas. Did you watch that? I mean, I can't, I can't listen to the, the text that like Charlie and Melissa read this morning without hearing it in Linus' voice. Can you? I mean, it's just like I, I hear it in Linus' voice. And so these are the stories that we, that we love, that we listen to. And what we've been saying in this series is that the reason we love these stories is because they... They bring us back to the story, right? The story that God's been telling. And so I thought this morning, since it's Christmas morning and we're all in here together, we would just read the Christmas story as told by Dr. Seuss in The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. In the event that you've never heard it, in which case, where have you been? <laughs> How could that be? How the Grinch Stole Christmas, or Teddy Owens. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask me why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve, hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in their town, for he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now, hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers, nervously drumming, I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow, he knew, all the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early, they'd rush for their toys, and then, oh, the noise, oh, the noise, 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 that's one thing he hated, the noise, 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 noise. Then the Who's, young and old, would sit down to a feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast. They would feast on who pudding and rare who roast beast, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they'd do something he liked least of all. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and the who's would start singing. And they'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. Somehow, but how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do. The Grinch laughed in his throat, and he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked, what a great grinchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I look just like St. Nick. 
All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around. But since reindeer are scarce, there was none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? Nope. The Grinch simply said, if I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dogs Max. Then he took some red thread and he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, giddy up! And the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark. Quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming sweet dreams without care. When he came to the first little house on the square, this is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claws hissed, and he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch, but if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once for a moment or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue, where the little who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, they're the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile almost unpleasant around the whole room, and he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn, and plums. And he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch, very nimbly, stuffed all the bags, one by one, up the chimbley. Then he slunk to the icebox. He took the, two, he took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out the icebox as quick as a flash. Why, that old Grinch even took their very last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee, and now, Grinched, grin, grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree, and he started to shove when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast, and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter who'd got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why, why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know, the old Grinch was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie, and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot, the fake Santa Claus lied, there's a light on this tree that won't light on one side, so I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. Then he patted her head, and he got her a drink, and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who went to bed with her cup, he went to the chimney, and he stuffed the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for their fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other Who's houses, leaving crumbs much too small for other Who's mouses. It was quarter past dawn, all the Who's still in bed, all the Who's still a snooze when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags, and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo-hoo to the Who's. He was grinchishly humming. They'll find out now that no Christmas is coming. They'll find out now as they're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the Who's down in Whoville will all cry, boo-hoo. That's a noise, Grinch, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he, he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes, then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought before. 
Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. There's a reason that this story persists, that it's sustained for decades, right? I don't know exactly when it was written, but there's a reason that the story lasts. The story lasts because it resonates with our hearts, doesn't it? It resonates with our hearts when we think about Christmas. And, and even though we do get caught up in it, I have to admit, even, I mean, I get caught up in it, the, the stress and the pressure a little bit of finding the right gifts and, and, and doing the, the things that you know will make people happy and you, you want to bring joy and and it can become just a little bit overwhelming sometimes. But when we take a step back, we recognize it really is not about the gifts that we give each other. Although that's tons of fun. I like getting gifts. This is my Christmas Patagonia. I don't buy Patagonia for myself. I buy Kirkland. But now I have, this is delightful. And uh, we like giving gifts and we like getting gifts. But we do know that's not the point of, of Christmas, that Christmas is about Christ's coming. And I was thinking about this story from John chapter 6 as I, as I was thinking about the Grinch and reading it. In John chapter 6, Jesus, you remember, feeds the 5,000 and then he goes across the lake and he goes across on the water. That's when he walks on water and he gets to the other side. And in John chapter 6, starting in verse 22, They come and find him. The crowds come and find him. This is what Jesus, this is is the account in John chapter 6. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, as he often did, by not answering them. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They say to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe? All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It's an interesting story that we get to hear, we get to enter into. Jesus feeds the 5,000, and they, they're attentive, and they go looking for him, and they said, um, how did you come to be here? And he says, okay, you, you didn't come seeking me because you wanted to know anything about that. You came because you wanted the bread. You came because of what you got from me. You didn't come because you saw the signs. You didn't come because I'm the Messiah. You didn't come seeking me because I'm the, the great rabbi or the great teacher. You came seeking me because you got your fill of the bread. You came seeking me to get what you wanted. And then he says, and what you want is me. 
That's the bread. That's the real bread. It's the only bread that lasts. Stop seeking for the things that perish and seek the things that don't. And so even this morning, I mean, not to put a damper on the gifts that we got, because, I mean, they're wonderful. We, we like getting gifts, or, and we like giving gifts. There's probably nothing that you got this morning that won't sometime find its way to Goodwill or the trash bin. It's just the nature of it. And some things last longer than others, but nothing really lasts in this world except the gift that you have of being with each other and the gift that you have of Christ who came. You know, you think about that, and um, maybe as you get older, I, I feel this as I get older. You know, it's like, hey, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? Or what do you want for Christmas? I don't know. You know, I'm kind of at the stage of life, and maybe you are too, where if I want something, I buy it. I don't, I don't have great needs, and, that, and that's, that's something I recognize is not everywhere. Not everywhere in the world, not even everywhere in our town is that way. But the, the fun of having family gathered around the living room, the chaos of it, the joy of it, that's that God has given us himself in Christ and that he's given us each other in this family. That's the gift. And I think sometimes... When we say that we hope in God, I think what we actually mean is we're hoping in what God might give us. We're hoping in, in the outcome that we want. But when we hope in God, really, what we're hoping is that God will meet us and that we'll see him. So we watch, we watch for God to show up with great expectation, that God will meet us in the places that we are. I woke up this morning and I was thinking of my friends who I was thinking of my friends who lost their daughter who's just 33 years old just a few months ago. And I was thinking there's no guarantee about today. There's just no guarantee about today. There's no guarantee that everything's going to be okay. There's no guarantee that I won't get sick or someone I love won't get sick. There's no guarantee that bad things won't happen. In fact, it's almost sure that things will happen that are bad and that are unpleasant. But what I can count on, the gift that will not go away, is the presence of God, the person of Christ who came and connected me and you back to the Father. He gave us himself, and that's the gift. And he gave us each other, and that's the gift. I was thinking about this. I never thought about this with the Grinch before. You know, you know what got the Grinch saved? You know what it was that converted him? It was the love that the who's had for each other and the day, the gift. It was, that was it. I was, I was struck with that, you know, that, that, that John says, this is how they'll know that we're followers of Jesus when we love each other. That's how people will know. And so, so many of these stories that we hear, so many of these stories we read year after year, they just point us back to the story that God's been telling them. John Eldridge, in his book, Resilient, says, the story of the church is still the story of the world. The story that we get to tell, that's still the story of the world. It's the story that God's been telling and that he planned to tell infinitely back into the past and is going to keep telling infinitely forward into the future. That's the hope we hold. It's not the things that we have. They will go away but the gift of Christ himself, the gift that the shepherds found in the manger, the gift that Mary pondered in her heart. What must this be? The gift that the disciples awakened to in the boat. Like, who is this that even the wind and the waves pay attention? That's the gift that we have. And so this morning, as we move next to our communion, I just want to remind us of what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. It wasn't Moses who gave your forefathers bread in the wilderness. It was, it was, it was God. It was me. It was the Father. And he comes to bring bread to us. And so we come each week, and we do communion together each week to remember the bread of life, to remember that Jesus is the one who came, that his body broken and his blood shed brings us into relationship with the Father and eternal life. I want to pray, and then servers will come, and I think you know how we do this. You'll come down those aisles, and you'll be served communion, and uh, 
We'll share this together this morning. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for light. We thank you for the light of the world stepping out of darkness and stepping into the world of gloom and bringing light. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that even in in your creation, even before you made us or anything, you had a plan for our redemption. That's how much you wanted us. You didn't have to think up a plan later after we stumbled around. It says that from before the foundations of the, of the world, you predestined us as sons and daughters. And so we thank you. We thank you for making us. We thank you for giving us each other. And we thank you for giving us yourself. Your body broken, your blood shed. That we might have life. And we, and we welcome that life and we remember that life. And Father, this morning as we come, we come with thoughts of joy and maybe thoughts of sorrow. Maybe there are things in our life that, that we need to bring before you in confession, but things that you have settled. Remind us that it's not about what we do, but it's about what you've done. As, as John writes to us, that if we confess, you are faithful to forgive us. And so there's no condemnation. I pray, God, if there's if there's stuff on our hearts this morning that we can lay at your feet, that we will do that. Because your, your body, Lord Jesus, and your blood take care of it and bring us to righteousness. We thank you for that. And we come to you in your name. Amen. Amen.